After her attention-grabbing debut novel, The Girls, Emma Klein has been quietly getting on with the business of writing. A story collection, Daddy, is now followed by a new novel, The Guest, another stylish display of Klein's considerable skills that follows a young woman drifting amongst the elite of Long Island with the threat of everything being washed away with one wrong decision. We sat down to talk about literary influences, portraying femininity, and avoiding the obvious. When I was reading The Guest, I had this moment where I was like, oh, this really reminds me, I'm getting something here of The Swimmer by John Cheever, and I thought I was so clever that I'd picked up on this reference. And then I got some videos from your publisher where you were talking about the book in which you directly referenced The Swimmer, <laughs> as did the two reviews I then read of the book. And I was like, oh, I'm not clever at all, it's really obvious. But anyway, <laughs> could we start off by talking about that influence a little bit? Because I think it's really interesting. It's an amazing story. And tell me a little bit about yeah. how that feeds into the guest. So John Cheever is one of my favorite writers. Um, and that's such a peculiar story of his. I mean, he doesn't write a lot of uh, most of his short stories are so grounded, um, but that one really takes this surreal turn, and I think of it as this kind of existential horror story. Um, and I knew I wanted some of that structure, um, even in a very loose way, with the guest. I feel like because the book only takes place over six days, and you know there aren't flashbacks, you don't get backstory. Um, it needed kind of its own internal structure without those narrative. Um, alleyways. So the, this idea that kind of in every scene she would seek out a body of water, like almost just having that kind of armature can be really helpful for me. Mm. And can we talk about Alex as a character? Because what's really fascinating about her is that we don't have an awful lot of information about her as we read the book, and yet there seems to be so much depth to her as a character. I thought it was really telling that in the first uh, sort of, as you say, in these bodies of water, the first point she's in the sea and she is not in control of <laughs> her direction, which serves as a great metaphor for her journey through the book. But tell me a little bit about creating Alex as a character and, and as I say, how you get those layers of, of character without giving too much sort of information. Yeah, um, so I always kind of knew with a character like this, like a character who's a young woman operating outside of our accepted moral code, that I really wanted to resist kind of giving her this backstory that explains why she is that way or why she's doing the thing she's doing, um, which I think oftentimes for, for women, the backstory is like trauma-based. Hmm. Um, and I really wanted to sort of push back against that with her and, and see if I could almost draw this character using negative space. Um, and I thought a lot about this idea of disassociation and kind of how to render a character who is in many ways disassociated from herself in fiction. Um, and I think like writing in the close third person really allowed me to achieve that, at least for myself. Um, and then deciding, okay, if you're not gonna get to know her via these traditional channels of backstory or whatever, it's going to be in how she assesses a room and what she notices and her observations and that the reader would would get to know her in that way get to know the contours of like what what she's observing so i'm really intrigued about that, that idea of negative space because uh, as i'm sure many writers if they're creating character i, I always sort of picture post-it notes and stuff plotted on walls and all that kind of stuff and if you're if you're not doing it through that traditional sense how do you keep track of, of what you're doing? Or is it a question of really just sort of getting the words down on paper and then going back over them to see whether you have been able to sort of... Yeah, you know, with her, with Alex, with her voice, um, writing her, there, it just felt like very, very natural. Maybe because there's something about kind of not leaving the present moment. Mm. You don't have to keep track of the consciousness across these vast terrains of time and space. It's very much you know, putting her in these scenes and moving her through. And there was something about, as soon as the voice clicked in, I kind of just trusted whatever she was seeing in a scene. Um, and it, it all felt cohesive. The only times 
that anything kind of stuttered with her is when I would try, you know, it's like such a classic procrastination technique for me. I'm suddenly like, oh, let's let's add in some backstory. Why not? Let's just see how it goes. Or like, let's change it all the first person. Just like busy work that I kind of know won't won't turn out. But like times when I I just for fun would add a little backstory and it just immediately felt wrong. Yeah. And kind of t- took away from the tone that I was hoping to sustain. Yeah. And then I suppose one of the things that she does do is to almost mold herself to the people that she meets in yeah. order to sort of insinuate herself into their lives so that in terms of her character, she can sort of be whoever right. they need her to be. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was thinking a lot about, I mean, Tom Ripley is such a great character like that somebody Mm. who's almost this alien learning learning the rules and learning the language and then mimicking it back um i mean less murder in this book (laughs) than in patricia highsmith novel but uh definitely that idea of like she's almost like water that you know you pour into these different vessels and they take on it takes on the shape of the vessel um and that was kind of fun too to think okay which which scenes will be interesting to watch this character in? Like, which communities or which dynamics do I want to see that that chameleon-like, you know, effect interact with? Yeah. Um, there's a phrase that's used in the book which I found really fascinating, which was, girls in drag as girls. Mm. Could you tell us a little bit more about what that sort of means? Yeah, I think it's like a... Th- thing I kind of noticed just looking back at any writing that I've done it's like you have these concerns that you return back to over and over and I think one of the the things that I I am like circling around and writing or interested in generally is just like the performance of gender and specifically like the performance of like femaleness Mm. um, and sexuality and I think that's why Alex was like a, an interesting character to me because uh, so much about her kind of literalizes those those questions for me, um, just in terms of like her youth and beauty being a very literal commodity that has a value attached to it. And so the transactions between her and men are a lot more overt. Mm. Um, whereas, yeah, in in another situation or with another character, it would be more you know, unspoken under the surface. Um, yeah, so that line is kind of just about women who, where, where you can see the labor of of the, like, gender performance, mm. I guess, which, of course, like, everyone's asked to do in some ways, but in the book I wanted it to be kind of hyper-exaggerated. Mm. Um, I suppose one of the challenges of having a, a, a character of whom we don't know very much um, and the style that you're sort of affecting in the book is how do you maintain tension, which you do, you know, from first page to last. And I suppose one of those is is the the timeline that mm. you have got a compressed. It's a you know it's a week, um, and we know it's going to be a week because we know there's this Labor Day party coming that she's going to try and insinuate herself into. Um, and there are a few other techniques that you use f- for tension. Uh, and the one that again always fascinates me is mobile phone usage. <laughs> So mobile phones, of course, the curse for a lot of totally. writers, right? So you mm-hmm. have to. F- how do you find a way of removing this piece of technology from your right. story? Because it could ruin. Oh, totally! Everything. And it would ruin so many books that we love from the past. Like if there was a mobile phone, you know, so yeah. many plot points suddenly don't work anymore. Um, so I do think it is a question, like how how do contemporary writers or artists of any kind deal with technology? I feel like I'm. You know, sometimes I like using technology in a story. Like, it can offer weirdness. Mm. Like, the idea of a character, you know, someone butt-dialing a character, and suddenly you have this portal to another world. Like, that could be an interesting inflection point. But I do think, like, as long as you feel in control of how you're using technology in the book, instead of feeling like... The technology is dictating the story. Yeah. So I think for me, it's like, okay, in what ways can I, can I make it so the phone is something that, that I as the writer can really decide. Sometimes it's gonna work. Sometimes it's not. Like, in a way that feels realistic and not too distracting. Um, 
yeah, because of course it's better for our purposes. If our purposes are, you know, tension and, mm. you know, tightening the screws, it's better for her not to have a working phone sometimes. Um, but I like the idea that it's this flickering, that it, in some ways it offers hope and in some ways it, it brings bad news all the time. <laughs> what I was going to say was that, you know, for anybody who's ever had a mobile phone with a slightly <laughs> dodgy battery, they will know that that anxiety that yeah. comes from, like, is it going to turn on right. or not? Mm -hmm. And she's living with that on a daily basis. Yeah. And as you say, you're, you're able as the writer to control when will it work, mm -hmm. when won't it work, when, when she needs it. And then, and then these, when it does work, that there is this threat that mm. is coming through it. That's the only means of communication for the, this one man who is trying to find out where Alex is, which seems to me rather brilliant use of a mobile phone for your own purposes. If yeah. you like that. Um, there's, as you said there, uh, this thing about trying to resist the idea of a foundational trauma, mm. if you like, for Alex, that we don't need to know why she's doing what she's doing. But of course, we're fascinated as the reader as, as to why she is. And what we see is this, I guess, performative side of her. And I was really intrigued by the way that that slightly changes. So when she meets Nicholas, the house manager mm. of a friend of hers, they, they're both performers in a way because of the roles that they have and what's really nice is to see how they you can see the the guard just starting to lower slightly could you tell me a little bit about that relationship and yeah. where nicholas comes from so nicholas is a house manager one of these you know it's a very niche job only for the <laughs> the ultra wealthy you know kind of this person who keeps the household running smoothly but you know, their their whole presence there is almost like a cruise director or something of this person's life. They don't do a lot of the actual work, but they kind of keep everything running and and they don't wear a uniform. They're kind of really meant to almost appear like another member of the family or a friend um, just to make their labor a little more invisible, I think. Mm. And I really liked the idea of somebody like that meeting Alex um, just because like you said they are both engaged in this form of labor uh, like these frictionless lives that the characters in this book want like the, the hyper wealthy um, Simon uh, it is this false reality mm. and it does require an, a massive amount of labor um, and yeah, they're they're on different sides of of the of the you know whatever they're they're offering different forms of labor, but it is to the same ends, which is to prop up this this false reality. Um, but it, I think for Nicholas, it's a little uncomfortable to see it reflected in someone else. Um, like he has to maintain the boundaries in order to perform that kind of job. Um, whereas Alex. Uh, classically pushes the boundaries or has none. <laughs> <laughs> and um, of course they both I guess in another way represent one of the other novels sort of concerns which is this idea of of class and power because neither of them are in positions of, of great power and certainly a, a l lower on the class I always think of class as being a very English obsession. Mm. So it's really interesting to see you writing about it here in a very American one. And just to be clear, because there's a bit of confusion about where the book is set actually. So <laughs> it's Long Island. Are we looking at the East Coast of America? Or, yes. 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 Because I think people think of you as being a California <laughs> writer. But tell me a little bit about that, that, how class operates on this level over on the sort of, you know, the East Coast yeah. of America. Yeah. I mean, it, it's a very specific slice of this community. I mean, Long Island is very big and there's lots of different facets of it but this one slice that's hyper specific is you know the Hamptons um, East Hampton Amagansett all those little towns and mm. I haven't spent that much time out there but uh, the few times I visited friends you know for a weekend I was just really struck by how the power elite of New York seemed to have sort of packed up and reconstituted themselves out there for the summer, just for three months. Yeah. They build this this mini community um, that, that has its own rules and traditions and that is very much, you know, organized to keep outsiders away. You can't park at the beach unless you have a resident parking pass. Like, it's not a place 
people come for the day. You really have to know someone. You really have to be meaning to go there. Um, you have to belong in whatever way. Mm. And they make that pretty clear. Um, and I think it is just, you know, the just the size of the houses. Like everything's kind of in your face there. It's all very, very on the surface. Um, and thinking about what what a character like Alex might look like in that kind of community. Um, one that is so, so built up to keep people like her out. Um, yeah. I think I had somewhere that you said that on, on Long Island there can be this kind of thing where you can't just go to the beach. The beach is private for residents. Yeah. You have to, you have to basically show that you belong there. Yeah. Which, that blows my mind that that's, that's right. even possible. No, it's very American, I guess, isn't it? Um, yeah, unless you have the parking pass in your car, which you only get if you live there. If you have a house, you pay taxes, then, you know, they'll tow your car, you'll get a ticket. Um, so it is just this sense, like, it, everything about that place is saying, like, this is a place for a very specific kind of person. Um, and just even the the kind of clothing that's worn, you know, there's like a similarity to a lot of it. You just start to feel like, okay, there's a uniform, there's a language, um, there's a hierarchy. And it is interesting. I can't really think of a, a California equivalent, but no. definitely as, as someone from the West Coast, I was really struck by, by it when I first visited. And then it's married to such a like kind of surreal, beautiful landscape. And that really struck me too. It's like all, all of this human kind of ugliness so visible right next to just really beautiful, mild kind of dreamscapes. There was something, of course, we've all been obsessively watching Succession mm. over here. And there was something about that sort of rarefied, these locations where you and I cannot go. Right. I do not have access. Totally. And I suppose also that thing as well, I remember hearing one of the actors being interviewed and, and he, he was saying that one of the realisations for him about how a simple thing that showed how different these people were was that they just never wear coats mm. because they don't have a need right. for one because you get out of the limo uh -huh. and you get onto the private jet. Totally. <laughs> so why would you need a coat? Right. And I thought, well, that, that's, that's very much this world, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, totally. In. The idea that like you can remove all hardships, even like the you know daily annoyances, certainly the larger ones, but just the daily annoyance of you know feeling slightly <laughs> cold at any time or, you know, being hungry and having to make something for yourself or kind of just every need is met almost at the same instant mm. that the desire is formed. Um, and I think there's something about that, something about that neutering of, of like friction in your life, mm -hmm. like that, the way everything is smoothed out that actually makes people really depressed. Not that, you know, we feel so bad for the hyper rich. The poor millionaires. Going, yes, <laughs> but there was something about that, like where, what are you left with when all of that goes away? All of the business of living. Um, and it is this kind of weird void, this pleasureless void where things cease to have meaning, like things that might give you pleasure. And there's something about that that felt similar to Alex too. Just that she's also kind of operating in this void. Um, but of course, they're coming at it from different angles. Mm. And I wondered if I could uh, take you back a bit, actually, because in fact, so I was working at Vintage when, when The Girls was published. And obviously, it was a really big deal. Uh, and I, I remember thinking, if you're a young writer and you get a lovely big publishing deal, that must be amazing. But also, that must be kind of terrifying. And there's a lot of pressure on you. Looking back on that time now, now that you've had your book of stories and now the next novel, how does it feel to look back on that now? You know, how, how was that pressure? And are you grateful in a way, I suppose, to be the other side of it now that you're moving on to another book? Yeah, I think what, what turned out to be really lovely and wasn't conscious was like putting out a book of stories after the girls. Yeah. Um, I love writing short stories. I love reading short stories. And... There's something, I just feel like it's operating on this different plane than writing a novel. Mm. I think of writing a novel as like major surgery, <laughs> like you really like, 
it, you know, the stakes are high. Yeah. It, it's this such complicated uh, process. And short stories for me are kind of like acupuncture. Okay. Like you get to just drop in these, these little silver needles and hopefully, you know, there's a ripple of, of something. Um, and I think, yeah, just being able to put out, to work on and put out a book of stories felt almost like a, just a return to what I love about writing and mm. almost like this little mental break, which I, I think was helpful looking back. But yeah, it wasn't something I, I consciously like knew to do, mm. but yeah. It's really interesting because I've spoken to lots of authors and so many of them who do write both stories and novels have said exactly the same thing, that the work required for a novel is huge and taxing and all the rest of it, whereas there's a joy that comes from being able to sit down and, yeah. and focus on a story. And what's interesting to me is that I know that readers love reading short stories and yet they're still quite problematic form, I suppose, in, mm. in the UK especially, to get people to kind of take them seriously. Right. And, what, why is that, do you think? Cause... I don't know. I wish, like, I I have no idea. I almost think, you know, as we all become completely brain dead with our phones, maybe short <laughs> stories will make a, make a return. Um, but I don't know. I do love them. It feels like there's something about, well, certainly the scale, but almost that they feel more like how life feels to me. Yeah. Like a novel, no matter what, like you're there's this frame of artifice or you kind of it's hard to write 300 pages without engaging with the novel as a form and an idea yeah and I think short stories you know obviously they have forms and structures but there's I think more room for ambiguity or or mystery or kind of just these little drops into people's lives and then you you drop away um and that's really like moving to me um, I'm going to bring us back to Chiva to finish off, if you don't mind, because that story, um, as we've said, is is really extraordinary because of the way that the tone changes as mm. you're reading it. And you sort of, if anybody listening who hasn't read it, it's you can find it online. Yes. It's very easy to find it. You could read it. Although I would recommend also getting the complete Chiva and just reading <laughs> them all. Um, and I, f I find it, it's quite, not depressing, but it, it leaves you in quite a bleak place at the end of that story. And I wondered how you feel about this book, whether you feel that the ending leaves you somewhere equally bleak or whether there's something <laughs> positive at the end of it for Oh, your bleak. Character. Certainly bleak. <laughs> um, yeah, I think there was something like that I really, you know, the ending of that story, The Swimmer, it's like, okay, suddenly you're in a nightmare. What you thought was, you know, a beautiful summer day it's winter, everyone you've ever known or loved is gone. Like your, your life is vapor. You found yourself in like a dark wood and there's no, there's no going home. It's just the absolute worst. <laughs> and I think I wanted to, I, I wanted something of that tone to end this novel. Just that, that sense of nightmare logic and kind of, the way that life has carried you along someplace without you looking up and realizing it. Mm. And by the time you do, it's too late. <laughs> so it's really cheerful and then, yeah, hopeful. <laughs> do, do we think Alex is going to be all right? I don't know. It's not, uh, not for me to say. <laughs> the Guest by Emma Klein is out now. And for a strictly limited time, you can find signed copies in your local Waterstones or on waterstones.com.